Live from New York, it's theCUBE. Covering Big Data New York City 2016. Brought to you by headline sponsors, Cisco, IBM, NVIDIA, and our ecosystem sponsors. Now, here are your hosts, Dave Vellante and George Gilbert. We're back, Daniel Henderson is here from IBM. He's the Vice President of Integration and Governance, and he's joined by Shiv Sagal, who is the Solutions Architect and Product Manager at RSG Media. Gentlemen, welcome to theCUBE. Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Shiv, let's start with you. RSG Media, we know what IBM does, Daniel. <laughs> so what, what is RSG Media sure. all about? So a little bit about RSG. Um, we are a software solutions company, and we've been around for the past 30 years, and we've been working around with the world's leading cable and broadcast networks, for example, like Viacom, AMC, Discovery, the over-the-top folks, whether it's the four sports leagues and the consumer uh, uh, product side in terms of how jerseys are sold, hats are sold in various distribution channels, and of course the studios, and anybody really in media and entertainment who creates content, who sells content, those are the folks who are using our systems today. Okay, and they use that to increase the productivity of their activities, their merchandising? Yeah, so over time actually this, the media and entertainment industry is actually quite interested quite interesting because it's always changing. And over time, it's been evolved, it's been evolving much more to understand who your audience is and where people are actually going to engage with your content. So it started off being, you know, folks are on linear TV, they read the newspapers, they got the radio, but now you have the tablets, the desktops, the PC, mobile, and you could watch real content, long form content, you could watch short form content on YouTube. So it started off as just being what's available and what can we use, but now who's watching our stuff on what platform, what are they engaging in, and what are these different uh, types of content that are driving our viewership, and how can we better understand those people who are watching our content so we could provide them more personalized content, hyper-target them for advertising marketing. Okay, great, and we're going to talk more about that, but Daniel, let's go to you. Uh, you guys, big week this week. Uh, you guys get some big, big announcements, you know, driving the whole cognitive vision. Governance, which is part of your title, that's been a big deal over the last couple of years. You had all these Hadoop projects spinning up big data projects and yep. somebody said, whoa, wait a minute, let's bring those, those in. So give us the quick update from your standpoint. So um, we've been, as part of the IBM DataWorks um, piece of work, been rethinking what governance means. Um, often when our clients think about governance, they think about it from a compliance standpoint. I got to do it in order to solve my e-discovery needs, my records and retentions needs. But especially in the big data side, you build a data lake, you got to understand what's inside of it. Once you understand what's inside of it, you want to make sure that it's being accessible to the individuals that might want it, but you want to do so in a way that actually exposes that data to only the individuals that should have it, not, not to necessarily everyone that might be, uh, for instance, um, have access to the data but perhaps shouldn't have it. So modern data governance is our take, and ultimately it means infusing metadata in our IBM DataWorks platform so that we understand the data in all of our data products. And once we have that, we can infuse policies and automatically enforce policies so that you can construct things like data lakes and deliver not just the compliance that's necessary, but also the value with, with the trust that's assured. And the value comes not only from risk reduction, but also is there a data quality component? Absolutely, yeah. so um, you know, governance is ultimately also about data quality. So who has access is one dimension, but also the data I deliver whether it's to do scheduling, for instance, for one of my clients as RSG, is going to depend upon how reliable that data is. Data quality is ultimately right. uh, a key factor in the reliability. All right, of data. so Shiv, let's get into your big data story. Sure. Okay, well, where did it start, and like, take us through the last sure. five or six years? If so, you, will. you know, I think it all started in the media and entertainment industry when Netflix and Hulu came to town. And I'm saying specifically Netflix and Hulu, probably YouTube as well if you want to include it. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, there was a, a traditional way to do business, right? People were comfortable and all of a sudden, oh my God, we have some new entrants. And what impact did that have? Well, actually now folks started to understand, all right, if we have people who are subscribing 9.99, who are those people, first of all? They're a younger generation and don't typically want to pay their cable bill. They really want to watch sports, but they're going to bars. So beforehand, we were just going to we have a deal with Warner Brothers, we usually get 20 movies a month, you know, 10 of them are comedy titles, perfect, we're good to go. But now they started to understand what's the ROI of actually us purchasing that one specific title. And now, nowadays, we're starting to get into the day and age where 
that one title that's being selected, we're starting to forecast and predict what is the rating on a certain network at any given point of time across any day part. What's that C3 rating where advertisers can start to understand the value of that specific time slot that the movie would be airing? And that's over, in, in a nutshell, what's happening is that uh, cable and broadcast networks started to get much more granular. We want to understand specific viewing uh, behaviors and understand how do we better target that ultimately that one individual eyeball. We all used to fit in one demo, adults 18 to 34, and we probably all fit in the same demo, but we all have varied interest. And that's the story really that is here, uh, you know, we're here to tell is that in today's day and age, you really, data provides a competitive advantage where you can run your business smarter, you could mitigate risk. And without these type of tools in today's day and age, you really don't have the wherewithal to understand just simply what's the ROI of your content and B, who is your audience and where are they? And you provide solutions to expose that ROI, do what ifs, you yeah. know, so test it, different scenarios. Yeah, so it all starts with understanding on, in the media and entertainment space, Nielsen is king. So just first of all, understanding what were the ratings for my content yesterday versus last week when it aired across different networks. What was the performance of that one show across different day parts? That was the usual use case. But now we want to understand, all right, if you have your content on both linear TV and Netflix, and we want to make sure we're talking about the same version of that content, the Wizard of Oz with James Franco, not the 1936 Wizard of Oz, and the SD version, not the broadcaster's, you know, director's cut. How do we start to understand how that one individual entity uh, uh, performed across platforms, and was there a digital lift? For example, Hulu is supposed to provide you that complementary viewing where you could watch something live and you could catch up on that current season on Hulu. So is there actually that complementary viewing pattern or are people just watching random stuff? And these are the different things that helps you make sure that you can engage with your subscriber, with your audience base, and taking these data points to better creating an effective linear schedule and making sure you could allocate the right content across the right platforms. And of course, we can't forget about the advertising and the marketing inventories, because that's where the money is. So I can't wait to hear, George, how <laughs> they do this. Wait, go ahead. Well, that was exactly <laughs> what I was going to ask. Which is, it sounds like you have more data uh, feeds or sources to deal with, some external perhaps some you can tease out internally that were, was difficult before, but then also, you know, what are the governance technologies that have to come into play for you to trust those data sources, internal uh, and external? You said the key word, George, it's all about trust, and Daniel, you're talking about governance. None of the analytics that we do means anything if you can't trust the approach to how you manage your data, and that's, first of all, step one. So the whole process in terms of how we try to make our data pipeline as tra transparent as possible is let's just get everything under one roof. Because you know, right now there's data on Excel, there's APIs, there's watch folders, there's you know, FTP sites, so let's just get it all under one roof. So that's step one. And then after you have step one, well, what are we talking about here? Are we talking about the linear data for Wizard of Oz, the HD version, not the SD version? Are we talking about the um, you know, on-demand version? You know, are we talking about the clips, the trailers? What is that reporting entity? So then we start to transform the data in a very cleansed view where we understand, all right, this was how that one specific entity performed across linear, non-linear, across these different tablets, devices. We start to break out the data in these very uh, I call them master tables, but ultimately it's these cleanse tables. And this process is very, very important. That, and it's very complex. There's matching algos that come into place with Spark and Python that says, that, all right, we have these different assets. We marry the, them together and clump them together. Um, but that process right there has, because it's machine learning, Obviously, we need to teach the machine how to do this, so it's a very hands-on approach to train the model to make sure that the matches are accurate across these platforms, and then blessing that as we start to move forward into building how that content performed, building out those table structures. So it's a, it's a data pipeline, it's some ETL magic that's happening, and ultimately, it's, these, uh, it's managing, whether it's DashDB or Cloudant, the operational databases that allow you to touch and access and massage that data in a very timely fashion, and by the way, this all happens under eight hours. Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> so Daniel, what, what role is IBM playing here? You mentioned Dash, DB, Shiv, yeah. and Cloudant. What do you guys provide? So, um, IBM, data uh, IBM DataWorks is our data and analytics platform 
And what you see is the potential impact that we could deliver through that platform. So the data pipelines that are funneling data into his landing zone, which is in DashDB, that's on Spark, a fundamental component of IBM DataWorks. He's applying machine learning for cleansing as well as for some of the scheduling optimization. That's Spark, our contributions in open source for machine learning our embedding of Spark in virtually every aspect of our offerings is a key component to that. The operational data that he needs to support his apps, Cloudant, which was a franchise that we brought into the fold and that we've integrated inside of a lot of our offerings, is a key part. So IBM DataWorks, the integrated, complete data analytics platform is underpins his, his solution. And his, great, his, his solution is a great example of, of the kind of applications you could build rapidly. And you access, access this on-prem, you do this through Bluemix and so software? It, it depends, or? honestly, on, the, on that client and their political um, you know, preference, to be honest. <laughs> we see a lot of clients moving to the cloud, but there's also those traditional folks who like their stuff on-prem. And that's the nice thing working with IBM, is that we have the flexibility, it's a non-issue. You want something on-prem, all right. You got Dash DB local, you want something cloud-hosted, all right, you're good mm -hmm. to go. So we have no preference. Um, as, as long as we're flexible, or, you know, then it's all good. Mm -hmm. It's ultimately what the client wants. Yeah. One of the questions we have is that in the big data ecosystem, the open source big data ecosystem, which is pretty much the same, um, there's a lot of innovation at, at the tool level and then a lot of sort of uh, experimentation on the go-to-market level. Um, to what extent did you choose IBM because they could bring all the pieces to bear and they could put them together? Uh, you actually perfectly... Um put the words together. Um, it's putting and packaging the right technologies together, and that's what ultimately we care about. Do we have the tools as a technology company to manage the data, to transform the data, to create the algorithms, to interact with the data? Can we build applications on a platform and be able to have our Node.js application or another Java-based application based off what that specific business need is? And IBM's platform, their DataWorks, uh, their Watson DataWorks project um, provides a huge uh, set of tools for us to be able to build what we need in a timely fashion. And the ability to, for us to prototype, as you said earlier, George, for example, coming up with an algorithm that schedules content appropriately on linear television, well, first of all, how are we going to build that model? Are we going to use the logistic regression, a random forest model, a time series model? And in fact, we did a little bit of everything and just compare it and contrast the outputs of all those various models and then meld them together. So the ability to fail, but fail quickly, the ability to prototype and do it quickly, and then package it all together in a nice seamless app, well, that's ultimately our business model, and that's ultimately the advantages uh, that we feel so on the this, platform. This, it's consumption models of linear consumption and nonlinear consumption. We talk about it all the time. You know, on the web, this nonlinear, it's like you know, little cookies all over the place, and, and Hansel and Gretel. Um, but then you see things like binge watching, yeah. which changes that equation. Yeah. So what are you seeing in terms of the consumption model? So the saying in the industry is linear dollars and digital dimes. <laughs> there's a lot of viewers in linear TV, but also there's a lot of viewers in nonlinear platforms, and you ultimately have to manage both. Um, so one, even though TV viewing is down, I believe the number is about 8%, um, and the number last year was about 6% um, overall. Um, there's still people watching TV in those households, and so for those folks who are tuning in, we want to make sure we have the most eyeballs watching your content. But for the uh, viewers on the nonlinear platforms, well, we're going to bring, bring it all together and understand when you're scheduling content on linear TV, what those viewing behaviors are on those nonlinear platforms so you can create a plan that engages with those nonlinear folks as well. So um, we are not siloed. We can't think of linear by itself. We have to think about them together, and that's actually one of our exact applications that we have cross-platform reporting, which allows you to understand the viewership of content across these different platforms. I love this, the, the saying, uh, linear dollars, uh, digital dimes. But the Olympics this year was a good example, where NBC put a big effort into live streaming uh, virtually everything, mm -hmm. uh, and the consumption patterns were as you described. But the industry seems to be trying to avoid what happened to, happen to the print publishing business. Mm -hmm. um, do you have confidence that they can navigate through that, or is it 
Just yeah, like, damn, um, the torpedoes were going, going at full speed ahead. I think the fact that the Wall Street Journal can charge a digital subscription as well as a paper subscription was just noteworthy by itself. Yeah. You know, the fact that they know that consumers want their products so bad that they will pay for two subscriptions. However, the media and entertainment industry, it's a little bit different where you have somebody who has a, maybe your parents have a cable subscription and then I will be able to watch TV everywhere using their login and authentication. So the, the business case is a little bit different where the MSOs, the service providers, the Comcast of the world, they allow you to share these credentials across, you know, there's five different accounts that you can use. So these concurrency limits, if the industry really wants to see what happened to the paper industry and, and take some notes, well, they should understand uh, people were able to monetize on both a, a paper subscription and a digital subscription. Right now, you just have one subscription that's enabling you access to this huge you know, locker of, of content. So until you start to see these different business models change, uh, right now, it's still, you know, it, nothing has changed it, on the it, MSO side. Right, but it's, it's and the journal is kind of the ex, the, the, the the exception to the rule, right? Exactly, I mean, it's, it's yeah, yeah. And, and, but they're the one know, of the few who are right, still around, the, I believe. The right, the vast majority. I mean, the, look at the Boston Globe. I mean, the number of reporters that they fund now is, you know, way down. But we probably could have bought it if we <laughs> traded enough, enough funding together. But the, the other billionaire grabbed it first. All right, Daniel, we're, we're out of time. We'll give you the last word on... Uh, on this week, big data week, big data NYC, Strata plus the Duke world, IBM announcements. Watson DataWorks is a big deal for us. Mm -hmm. It's not just the data and analytics platform that we're delivering. We're taking the best of the experiences that we've, we've uh, created with our partners and our customers and we're offering it through this method. So um, stay tuned, pay attention to Bluemix. You'll see more offerings, updates to existing offerings every week. It's amazing. Great, love it. Daniel wow. Schiff, thanks very much thank for coming on. Great much. story. Appreciate thank you. It. All right, keep it right there, everybody. We'll be back with our next guest. This is Big Data NYC. We're live from New York City. We'll be right back. <laughs>